G'day folks and welcome back to the top 20 VFL AFL goal kickers history where I'll be going through every year of the VFL slash AFL. You might have seen episode one which was 1897 to 1922 and that really centred on Dick Lee. We bring up the graph there and you can see that uh, at the end of 1922 which was the year that Dick Lee retired he was almost double the next person on the list Jim Freak. So this episode two is really about the first golden age of the goal kickers. And once again, I'm going to warn you all, this is going to get very nerdy. This is not for the faint-hearted. This is for true footy nerds. Okay, with no further ado, we will move on to 1923. Okay, 1923. Well, Essendon's Greg Stockdale set a new goal kicking record. He booted 68 for the season. And Geelong adopted the nickname the Cats after being known as the Pivotonians for years. That were the Pivotonians because it's like the pivot point between Melbourne and Ballarat, roughly equidistant, the two cities. And the new nickname came about after a cartoon about a lucky black cat was published in the Herald newspaper. An Essendon so-called mosquito fleet win the premiership over Fitzroy. Right, moving on to 1924 and Fitzroy's Jack Moriarty sets yet another goal-kicking record with a total of 82 for the season. And despite losing their last match of the year, Essendon finished on top of the finals ladder and are declared premiers in a year without a grand final. So a bit of an anti-climax there. Edward Kaji Greaves of Geelong wins the inaugural Brownlow medal. And it's probably appropriate. It went to a Geelong player because Charles Brownlow, who the medal was named after, was involved with the Geelong club. And Jim Freak retires after a career total of 442 goals and an average of 2.54 goals per game. And VFA Premier's Footscray caused an upset by defeating VFL Premier's Essendon in an end-of-season exhibition match. And there was a little bit of suspicion surrounding that particular game. Moving on to 1925. And Geelong's Lloyd Hagger, great name, led the goal kicking with a very respectable 78 goals, continuing the recent trend of bigger totals by the forwards. And after having an awkward nine-team competition since the demise of the University Club in 1914, the VFL admits not one but three new teams, Footscray, Hawthorne and North Melbourne, all from the VFA. So it's now a 12-team competition. And St Kilda's Colin Watson won the Brownlow and Geelong won their first ever premiership, defeating Collingwood by 10 points. Go to 1926. And Dick Lee's protege, Gordon Nuts Coventry, broke the season goal-kicking record with a total of 83. Melbourne thrashes minor premiers Collingwood by 57 points to take out their second flag. And their captain, Ivor Warren Smith, won the Brownlow medal. So we've got Gordon Coventry now entering the picture and you can see he's immediately leapt up to eight on the list. And Lloyd Hager is working his way up. So we've got some new faces in the uh, top 20 at this point, going to 1927. And Gordon Coventry has just broken his own goal-kicking record to lead the table with 97 majors and his brother, Sid, won the Brownlow medal. So it was a big year for the Coventry. And in a rain-sodden grand final, Collingwood defeat Richmond 2 goals 13-25 to 1 goal 7-13. And Gordon Coventry kicked both of Collingwood's goals. And you see he's already leapt up to third on the list. Lloyd Hager is snapping at his heels. So it's getting pretty interesting and going to 1928 now, and Gordon Coventry once again heads the goal-kicking table for the third year in a row with 89 goals, including a record nine in Collingwood's second successive flag over Richmond. For many years, that didn't stand as a record in the uh, grand finals. You'd often see seven was the record because of the weird systems they had, final systems back in the day, but it was effectively the grand final. So Gordon Coventry has broken the record now with nine goals in a grand final, and Ivor Warren Smith won his second Brownlow medal. And Gordon Coventry, as you can see, is second on the list. Okay, we go on to 1929, and Gordon Coventry has busted through the three-figure barrier with an incredible 124 goals for the year, including a league record haul of 16 in a game against Hawthorne. And Collingwood defender Albert Leeter Collier won the Brownlow medal. And Collingwood go through their entire home and away season undefeated, but get thrashed by Richmond by 62 points in what will become the second semi-final. But exercising their right to challenge as minor premiers, they defeated Richmond for the third year in a row to win yet another flag so a three-peat for them and Gordon Coventry is really snapping on the heels of Dick Lee at this point and then you can see there's a couple of uh, Fitzroy guys under there Jack Moriarty working his way up the list and Lloyd Hagger just under Cliff Rankin two Geelong players a couple of Carlton players there 
a couple of South Melbourne players with Ted Johnson working his way up the list. So it's getting pretty interesting at this point. Going on to 1930, and look who's on top of the list. He's just kicked another 118 goals, including a record total of 17 against Fitzroy. In fact, in his career, Gordon Coventry will have kicked individual bags of 14, 15, 16 and 17 goals. And by defeating Geelong by 30 points in the grand final, including seven goals by Gordon Coventry, Collingwood break the record for the most consecutive premierships with four, a record that still stands today. And Stan Judkins of Richmond won the Brownlow medal by a countback over Harry Collier and Footscray's Alan Hopkins. Uh, he played less games because they were only awarded one vote each at the time in the Brownlow. But in 1989, Collier and Hopkins were awarded posthumous respective Brownlows. Anyway, looking at the table, Gordon Coventry, as I said, has risen to top. Jack Moriarty there at third. He's done pretty well for himself. And Lloyd Hager by this stage has retired. Okay, 1931. And Carlton's rising star, Harry Soapy Valance, topped the goal kicking with 86. And there's some very new innovations that occurred in 1931. Norman Banks on radio station 3KZ broadcast the very first live radio football games. Also, the final system was finally overhauled to feature a final four with the top two teams receiving a double chance, the lower two competing in what was essentially an elimination-style final. And on this occasion, it was Geelong winning their second premiership by defeating Richmond. And this final system, which was known as the Page-McIntyre system, I think, or the Page system, would remain intact until the introduction of the final five in 1972. So finally, after, what, eight, 35 years, they've finally managed to work out a decent final system. None of this right to challenge and strange kind of group A versus group B and all that stuff. And likewise, the Brownlow medal, after having the three win at the previous year, will change from one player receiving just one vote per match to the 3 2 1 system that's still in place today, given to them by the field umpire. And the Brownlow medalist for 1931 was Fitzroy's Hayden Button. And in one game, Richmond scored 30 goals, 19, 199 to North Melbourne's 4 7 31. And Doug Strang kicked 14 goals in that game. And it's the first time that a team has kicked 30 goals in a match and this would remain the highest score in a VFL game for 38 years. So Sophie Valance has now come in and Gordon Coventry is stretching his lead over Dick Lee. Moriarty is starting to kick some more goals. They're at third place. 1932 and despite reigning premiers Geelong not making the finals their full forward George Maloney topped the goal kicking with 109 goals making him the second player to kick 100 goals in a season. That's a really good trivia question. Who was the second VFL player to kick 100 goals in a season? And Richmond defeated Carlton to win their third premiership and Hayden Button won back-to-back Brownlows. And Gordon Coventry is now past the 800 goal mark. And Jack Moriarty continues to kick some majors. Bert High there, a Hawthorne player. He's there at number 13, and that's the Hawthorne colours at the time, the brown Guernsey with the gold V. And also Fitzroy, they have got this new jersey with uh, just the maroon with a blue monogram on the front. So a couple of jumper changes going on. 1933, and South Melbourne's Bob Pratt led the goal kicking with 109. And they've also just got new jumpers. You can see there the red V on the jumper. They've, they've replaced the red sash. And not to be totally outdone, Gordon Coventry kicked 108 goals himself, making it the first time that two players kicked 100 goals in the same season. And coach of Melbourne, Frank Checker Hughes, instructed his players to play like demons in a match, and the name stuck. So from now on, Melbourne Football Club will be known as the Demons after being known as alternatively the Fuchsias and the Red Legs because of their plain red socks. Uh, St Kilda win a match over North Melbourne despite only having 15 men on the field and a special medal bearing an emblem featuring a cross on it is struck to commemorate the win. And the emblem will later be incorporated onto the St Kilda Guernsey. Wilfred Chicken Smallhorn of Fitzroy won the Brownlow medal and South Melbourne thrashed Richmond to win their third flag in front of a record crowd of 75,754 people. Uh, due, and this was during the Great Depression. So, you know, that many people to turn out in 1933 is quite remarkable. And Bob Pratt kicked a game-high three goals in the grand final as well. So Bob Pratt has now entered there in the bottom with the red V, as I mentioned. So we go on to 1934, and Bob Pratt smashes the goal-kicking records to boot an astonishing 150 goals in only 21 matches. And this is how we got them. 8, 10, 15, 6, 7, 4, 6, 5... 8, 7, 9, 8, 11, 11, 12, 3, 3, 5, 6, and 2. 
So only 21 games, he kicked 150 goals. What an incredible effort. Gordon Coventry, not to be completely outdone, helped himself to another ton as well, kicking 105 goals himself, and he became the first player at this point. Gordon Nuts Coventry, I don't know how he got the name Nuts, maybe I don't want to know, but he became the first player to kick 1,000 career goals. And Richmond exact revenge over reigning Premier South Melbourne to win their fourth flag. The South Melbourne team of this period are known as the Foreign Legion because they had so many interstate recruits going around. Many of these players were from Western Australia, which of course has the Black Swan as its emblem. And as there are also many swans in the, the nearby Albert Park Lake, South Melbourne became known as the Swans around this time. Though they're still referred to as the Bloods by diehard supporters even to this day. And Dick Reynolds won the Brownlow Medal. So it's shaping up now the top four particularly. You see Gordon Coventry has really stretched ahead from Dick Lee. He's basically doing what Dick Lee did in the first era. He is now becoming well and truly the dominant goal kicker. Moriarty, Sophie Valance are both uh, certainly posting some decent totals. And Bob Pratt has moved up to eighth spot with that incredible 150 goal haul. And you can see that Jack Titus of Richmond is starting to get a few goals together himself. 1935 and Bob Pratt led the goal kicking for the third season in a row, this time kicking 103 goals for the year. But unfortunately, he was hit by a brick van on the eve of the grand final and wasn't able to play. And ironically, the man driving the truck happened to be a South Melbourne supporter. So Collingwood subsequently defeated South Melbourne to win the grand final and Hayden Button became the first triple Brownlow medalist. And Footscray took to the field in this year wearing an outrageously loud new jumper, which only lasted one season. And I've got a version of it there on the bottom with Albie Morris Morrison having entered the top 20. It was a wild, very 1930s design. Yeah, they only wore it for the one year. I think it was just a bit too much. Okay, we'll get on to 1936 and Bill Moore of St Kilda led the goal kicking with 101 goals and became St Kilda's first player to reach a ton. Collingwood defeated South Melbourne again to win back-to-back premierships to take their total to 11 flags, the most in the league. And South Melbourne have now played in 10 grand finals but have only won three. And Fitzroy's Dennis Dinny Ryan won the Brownlow medal, and Jack Moriarty has retired. Okay, 1937, and Gordon Coventry is a leading goal kicker for 1937 with 72 in his final year of football. Coventry retires after 306 games, a slightly frustrating 1,299 goals, at an average of 4.25 goals per game. So that's serious goal kicking. Only Bob Pratt has a better average, and he's just a fraction over with 4.29 at this point. And fittingly, while Coventry kicked three goals in his final match, a grand final lost to Geelong his protege Ron Todd booted four on that day and Dick Reynolds won his second Brownlow medal so anyway there's Gordon Coventry on the top of the table with uh, 1299 goals and Bob Pratt Jack Titus are working their way up okay 1938 Collingwood's Ron Todd headed the goal kicking with 120 majors including 11 in the preliminary final against Geelong Dick Reynolds became the second triple Brownlow medalist and Carlton break a 23-year-old drought to win their sixth premiership, beating arch rivals Collingwood in front of a new record crowd of 96,834 people at the MCG, with many patrons spilling onto the ground. Sophie Valance is kept to one goal in that game and he retires with 722 at a highly respectable average of 3.54 goals per game. And Ron Todd kicked four goals in the losing side. So Sophie Valence is there, number two on the table. He's overtaken Dick Lee. Never kicked 100 goals in a season, but average of 3.54. Obviously a very, very handy full forward. Bill Moore is there in the top five. Jack Titus is working his way up. Bob Pratt. So yes, a movement again by the new guys. And there's Keith Forbes there representing North Melbourne. 1939 and Rod and Todd once again led the goal kicking with 120 goals same as the year before and once again he kicked 11 in the preliminary final but Melbourne thumped Collingwood to win the grand final despite Todd kicking six goals in the match and he's 23 for the final series was a record that stood for 50 years until Gary Ablett senior broke it with 27 in 1989. But Ablett had the luxury of four games. Todd had only played three. So an average of nearly eight goals a game in the final series for Ron Todd. And Collingwood's Marcus Whelan won the Brownlow medal. And the grand final is Ron Todd's last game for Collingwood. He played 76 games to the Magpies, kicking 327 goals at a superb average of 4.3 goals per game. An average only slightly bettered by Bob Pratt with 4.32. So they've now got the highest two averages in the VFL at this stage. 
match. Okay, 1940. And Richmond's Jack Titus added the goal kicking with exactly 100 goals. Though his Tigers get trounced by Melbourne in the grand final. And both Bob Pratt and Ron Todd have crossed over to the VFA, where they're able to earn much more money than in the VFL, which has the Coulter Law, which restricted the amount that players could be paid. Pratt went to Coburg, where he would kick a record 183 goals in the 1941 season. And Todd went to Williamstown, where he would break Pratt's record with 188 goals in 1945. So these guys were obviously turning the turnstiles over and were worth watching in the VFA and they were offered the big bucks and they took it and I believe that the Collingwood boardroom reversed his picture on the wall and, and kept it that way for many years. They were pretty disgusted with him leaving. Now, Collingwood's Des Fothergill and South Melbourne's Herb Matthews tie for the Brownlow medal and are unable to be separated by a countback. Both players are awarded replica medals. Now, the countback was when whoever had the most best on grounds got to win the medal. The most three votes. Pretty silly system, really. Anyway, both players were awarded replica medals. In fact, five Brownlows were eventually struck for 1940. There was the original, which the AFL still owns, two replica toy medals handed out in 1940 to the two, and the two genuine medals that were struck and handed out retrospectively in 1989. And Essendon changed their nickname from the same old Essendon to the Bombers, most likely inspired by the current war that was going on and possibly also that there was the Essendon Airport in their backyard. Now you can see Jack Titus has gone to second on the list. Bill Moore has jumped up to third and Rod Todd's there at 19. We know he won't kick any more goals and George Maloney, the second player to kick a ton, is on his way out. Okay, 1941, Melbourne's Norm Smith topped the goal kicking with 89 goals, kicked three in their grand final win over Essendon, making it a hat trick of flags for the Demons. However, Smith's former teammate Ron Barassi had been killed in action at Tobruk, and Smith will later become a father figure to Ron Barassi's son, Ron Barassi Jr., and they will have some serious history together in the next couple of decades. And Norm Ware of Footscray won the Brownlow medal, and this is the last Brownlow medal to be issued until the end of World War II. And Bill Moore has now retired after 195 games for the Saints and 735 goals at an average of 3.77 goals per game. Looking at 1942, and South Melbourne's Lindsay White topped the goal kicking with 80 goals. White had kicked 67 goals with Geelong in his first season, but with the Cats withdrawing from the league due to transport restrictions, he switched to the Bloods. And Roy Kazali of Up There Kazali fame is coach of Hawthorne and leads them to their best season thus far. They only missed making the finals on percentage, and he also was to suggest that they drop the May Blooms nickname and become the Hawks. Because I believe the Hawthorne Bush blooms in May, which is why they were called the May Blooms, but it Shocking name. Hawks, much better. And Essendon trounced Richmond in the grand final to win their seventh premiership. And 1943, Richmond's Dick Harris headed the goal kicking with 63, including seven in the Tigers' premiership win over Essendon, played at Carlton's Princess Park due to US servicemen taking over the MCG. And Jack Titus has retired after kicking 970 goals in 294 games and an average of 3.3 goals per game. 204 of those 294 games were played in succession, a record that stood for over 50 years until the late great Jim Steins of Melbourne beat it by playing 246 in a row. And Jack Skinny Titus, as he was known, uh, had the dubious distinction of playing in the most losing grand finals of anyone in history with six. Uh, Rene Kink played in six non-winning grand finals with Collingwood and Essendon, but one of those was the famous 77 draw. Uh, Sal Murray there of North Melbourne is going up the list. I couldn't find a photo of him. And Dick Harris is there, number eight. So with some of these retirements now, it's going to be a while before we see people really coming up. Okay, 1944, and Melbourne's Fred Fanning led the goal kicking with 87 goals. Fitzroy won their eighth VFL Premiership, which was played at the St Kilda Cricket Ground, which would prove to be the last they would ever win under that name. 1945, and Fred Fanning once again tops the goal kicking, this time with 67. And North Melbourne make the finals for the first time. But Carlton are the big story. Having lost their first six matches of the season, they won 13 of the next 14 games. And with World War II finally over, the grand final, played at their home ground of Princess Park, was named the Victory Grand Final. But there was no peace during that game. And the match between Carlton and South Melbourne has gone down in history as the bloodbath, with nine players reported on 15 charges. In fact, the previous week's preliminary final between Carlton and Collingwood had been almost as bad as well. There's a great book by Ian W. Shaw called The Bloodbath, and it's one of the best books about football I've ever read. Anyway, Carlton went on to win the game by a fairly comfortable 28 points. 
So with the end of World War II, that's where I'm going to leave it. The first golden age of the full forward. And as you can see, really, with the top 13, Dick Lee is the only one from the original era to be in amongst this new breed of full forward or forward. And there's Albie Panham there at number 11. He's the third Panham to make this list. He was the brother of Charlie Panham and the son of Charles Panham, who was in the very, very early days of the league and was the first guy to ever play 100 VFL games. I hope you've enjoyed this rather lengthy chat about really the history of the VFL year by year, but also focusing on the great goal kickers. And this is definitely the end of an era, which obviously the game of football had sped up and opened up. Scores were, were bigger than they ever had before. So the 30s must have been a great time to be looking at uh, the game of footy. But it does dry up a bit uh, in the next episode, save for one high-flying champion of the game. So if you enjoyed this and want to know where the next episode is, subscribe. There's not a lot of other football stuff that I tend to post on this channel. It's mainly music related, but this is an exception. I hope you enjoyed it and goodbye for now.